The dream of this is to have this car on the iceberg and capture people's imagination. What we're looking for is a big chunk of flat ice. We've been trying to find an iceberg and a stable iceberg to put the car on top of it. They keep breaking, they keep melting. You would have to work through the night for about 24 hours to get this into any sort of condition. I think it's not going to be possible to do it. All icebergs, even the biggest one, breaks. Are you concerned about the car? We've been concerned about the car all the time. We've got two hours to salvage this. I'm happy to help you. This one has cracks all over. This has been incredibly challenging. You can't get moving in five minutes. Then he has to drop it. The reason there hasn't been a car on an iceberg before is it's difficult. If it was easy, everybody would have done it. They are majestic, but they're also a ticking time bomb. Hong Kong, October 2016. The third season of the Formula E Championship is about to get underway. 12 races over five continents across the globe to decide our season three champion. Alejandro Agag, CEO and founder of FIA Formula E, is breaking new ground in China. Season three of Formula E, and away we go. Formula E strives to be the definitive 21st century motorsports package. International, competitive, digital. With a difference, one key innovation. And that innovation is electricity. This is the world's first all-electric single-seater racing competition, endorsed by motorsports governing body, the FIA. It's a massive commitment towards clean energy, a commitment they take very seriously indeed. Formula E has one mission, to promote electric cars. We want, one day, all cars in the world to be electric. The message that Formula E wants to put forward for the public is the right one, that we, we have to drive more electric cars. It won't solve the problem, but will help the problem. We, coming from motorsport, thought we could make a change with this championship, with this electric car championship. The adoption of electric cars has never been more important. In recent years, the damage caused by the release of carbon emissions into our atmosphere has become increasingly alarming. The sea is already swallowing villages and eroding shorelines. Glaciers are melting at a pace unprecedented in modern times. Giant waves were pounding the tiny town. This crisis is changing the natural balance of our planet. Everywhere you look, it's destruction. Oh my goodness, Mr. Mayor, this is not good. This looks worrying. Forecasters expect drier, hotter, windier weather by this weekend. Submerged countries, abandoned cities, fields that no longer grow. It's very clear that voluntary approaches have not worked. All that I have seen and learned on my journey terrified me. Academics around the world are focusing in on the problem of climate change the key environmental issue of our age. I think we should stop talking about climate change and we should talk about global warming. Let's call a spade a spade. There was this thing that, oh, well, we, we mustn't call it global warming because there's no proof that it's warming. It is warming. The Arctic 
is warming the fastest of all. There isn't any possibility that it's, it's not the case. I mean, it's, it's straightforward physics that you add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, you warm the Earth. We are um, presently, globally, pumping about 35 or 40 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere per year. That's about five tonnes of carbon dioxide per person per year. Odourless, colourless. It's a huge amount of rubbish. Yeah, it's very likely that in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years time, we will have no summer ice at all. It's the emergency which is happening slowly enough that the public can, can try to forget it and not do anything. And that's, that's making things much worse. We've got a choice. Whoa. Why are we taking these risks with our one and only planet? I think electric cars are great. They will very much reduce our carbon emissions so long as the electricity generating system is also renewable. Buying an electric car is only the first tiny baby step towards solving the problem. But you've got to start with those baby steps. London, England, June 2016. It's the off season, a busy time of year for Formula E. In their West London office, the team carry on the 24 7 business of getting their message out there. That's a monitoring of the icebergs. They tend to think ambitiously. And, that the schools and Alejandro is excited about a new project. I think that's, I think that's really good that keeps to take a Formula E electric racing car. So you have to ship it to Greenland and drive it on an iceberg. Good. OK, guys, iceberg. Doing this. Excellent. OK, so now we just need to plan it and make it happen. Well, and make sure the iceberg doesn't crack and we all sink. I had a, you know what? <laughs> Can you guarantee that? <laughs> That's after we've all got off the... Uh, <laughs> Behind the idea is Jeremy Hart, who will lead the project. Jeremy specialises in delivering the impossible. And we are going to look at extending the window at the end of the month. The number of people on the iceberg is limited by the number of people we can get off with the sea king. So it, he'll be... Because, you know, if the sea king goes back to land and then it's half an hour away and the icebergs start cracking, then I think we're... It's effectively a connection, a visual connection, between electric cars, a racing electric car, and the big challenge of global warming. Then go, hang on, you know, we've only got a one, three, five. I think people can really associate electric cars as part of the solution. Uh, even if we had two smaller helicopters, it's not... It's not <laughs> A midnight testing session is held on an ice rink near London. It's a new challenge for the mechanics and the driver who will take on the Arctic project. Multiple E Prix winner, Lucas de Grassi. Rip it up. It depends on what he wants me to do. If it, if, even if the ice bag is this much, to do a donut in the middle is quite easy. For the first time, the single-seater electric racing car is fitted with ice tyres. And Lucas has his chance to have a bit of fun. Pretty cool. I mean, the only thing is, you know, if it's a little bit like this, we have to just make sure that it doesn't kind of slide and fall in the water. I'm worried that Lucas is going to spin, he's going to spin off the side, and it's going to be a tragedy for everyone. Well, no, just for him. Just for him. Well, we lose the car, too. And we lose the car. Yeah. Apart from that. Apart from that, it should be fine. We get a lot of ideas, but when we see one, or when I see one, I really try to push for it. Even within Formula E, there's people who say, I mean, maybe it's a bit too crazy for us, but I've really been pushing this 
I took it personally to the partners. How's it feel? Okay, a bit. Then uh, it's tricky to to get it to spin because the front slides much more than the rear. Yeah, I've seen. I've because seen the of the weight, like this, looks amazing. Who better than Lucas? He knows the championship. He's been with us from the beginning. He knows very well what the message is. So I think he's a great uh, driver to take this car for the first time on an iceberg. July, on the remote east coast of Greenland, the edge of the Arctic Circle. The population of the east coast, stretching 1,500 kilometers, is just 3,000 people. The nearest major hospital is 750 kilometers away, across the North Atlantic, in Iceland. Project director Jeremy has been here for weeks, searching for an iceberg to drive the car on. Now he's standing on an iceberg he thinks will fit the bill. Three times this is going to be nine hours. No, With him, three times a glaciologist, Nico Segreto, an expert in Greenland icebergs, and Carlos Nunes, once a key member of Michael Schumacher's Formula One team, now technical director of Formula E. Carlos has traveled thousands of kilometers to see for himself if an electric racing car can run on an iceberg. We can put more guys on it. That's not a, uh, that's not a challenge. So what's actually happened then? Because has ice built up on what you level, or has it gone no. down? No, it's, it's dropped down in areas of... Yeah, the reality is this melting is going on 24 hours. Yeah. Exactly. This tells me nothing. That, that was the whole point of me coming here, was to be able to see what we're going to run on. This is not what we're going to run on. But this ain't anywhere near what, as we need it. The surface that the project wants, it's very big, with manpower and maintenance and snow on top with these uh, temperatures. I think it's not going to be possible to do it. And the pots we filled with ice, uh, wishing for a colder evening. Yeah, but the whole point, as I say, was for me to come here and see you a level surface? Well, there was a level surface here yesterday afternoon. Yeah, and well, why didn't we time it for when we were going to come here then? Well, the, the, we were in the hands of the uh, helicopter availability, unfortunately. The biggest uh, danger when we are on it is the, is a, would be a big fracture happening. So not from the edge, but a fracture through the middle. It's like an earthquake. You, you cannot predict it. Personally, I'll only give the go ahead if I see it the way it needs to be. Yeah. I can't, I can't uh, ask anyone to invest any money when it's like this. It's quite dangerous, especially in summer, to, to try to work on an iceberg because the edges of the iceberg are always collapsing. If you look at the ice in your gin and tonic, you, you'll find that it'll be melting and then you might notice it'll suddenly tip over because it's a different shape. It's uh, very unpredictable. We're used to things being so stable and a big iceberg might be kilometers across, feels stable, but in a very short time it can just tip over. It's a very wet landscape, uh, very unsafe for, for trying to, to take a car through it. Jeremy and Nico head back to the iceberg once again. No time to lose. They have to convince Carlos they can produce a smooth racing track before they head back to London. So 
So what we're going to do is just tidy down literally a, a clear area here. Yeah. Any uh, any holes that uh, we need to need to fill in. I mean, in fact, what it seems to have sta it seems to have stabilised. Undulations aren't a problem. What a problem is when you fall a hole like that with a wheel. Yeah. yeah. Then the car completely collapses. This time, Carlos is not entirely dismissive. Just fill that hole. Don't do anything more. Maybe there is hope. Maybe this can work. So as long as yeah. that is less than yeah, yeah, no, no. Four. Well, what you've done there is what you need. Back in London, it's decision time. Facing the reality of a major logistical operation in East Greenland, the complications pile up. As well as the car, they also need to work out how to get a film crew safely on and off the iceberg. They see all those cracks on the iceberg, it looks pretty cracked already. Turns out there's no such thing as a flat iceberg. They're irregular, unreliable, dangerous. You know, like I said to you, the two things I'd like to agree on today is the storyboard is very important. Yeah. So it satisfies what Alejandro wants. And then from that, we have to work out the area we need to, to get the simulated speed or whatever you want. We have to do the done. We have to do the done. Yeah, we so really to we now know Will Jeremy's plan work? Not easily deterred, Alejandro elects to press on. Just for the, like you say, we get it going straight. Yeah. When you get enough shots of the car going straight, We'll try to do that. The order is given to pack up the car and send it to Greenland. Carlos's team is at the Formula E testing center to make sure his car travels in the manner to which it's accustomed. Formula E thinks hard about sustainability. So rather than fly the car to Greenland, they pick the most economical journey, the one that leaves the smallest carbon footprint by truck from England to the port of Aalborg, Denmark. And then by scheduled cargo ship across the North Atlantic to the tiny port of Tassilak. A total distance of 5,000 kilometers over eight days. It's now early August. The Formula E advance party is in East Greenland to prepare for the ice drive project. Well, we're back in Tassilak, which seems to be our second home at the moment, and um, we're just going to go and see whether the container containing the car uh, has arrived safely. The ship from Denmark has, uh, has just come in, and we're going to go and see if it's come off uh, and got the piece of kit that we need. So here are um, a lot of containers, st stating the obvious, and uh, we're going to try and see if we can find the one that has the car in. If I can remember the number, I would do. A very large container. TRH ends in 43. TRH, TRH, that could be it. TRH, you... That's frustratingly close. There's a truck, that's not much use. TRHU 365 There's a whole load more over there. There it is. Up on top there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good news is our container's here and inside it is uh, the Formula E car and all its bits. The bad news is uh, we need to get it down off there and, uh, and out. The car is unpacked and taken to the heliport, driven through the streets of Tassilak. With a population of 2,000, this is the biggest town in East Greenland. It's all a bit real now. Car, helicopter, Greenland. From here, the car and all its equipment must be airlifted 
to the island of Kulusuk, close to their chosen iceberg. Your cards there. That's ready to load when it comes up. Roll the car back on. Yeah. You ain't gonna have no ramps or nothing at the other end, mate. We can't put anything underneath here. No, no that's the way for way, mate. In the meantime, Jeremy and glaciologist Nico have work to do because the first iceberg they tested in July has now broken up. Fortunately, they found a replacement iceberg in the fjords north of Tasilak. This one is larger, but it's still hard to see how they're going to drive a racing car on this surface. All we need is uh, an area about two and a half metres wide, just about a bit wider than the car, maybe 30 or 40 metres long, and a, and a sort of circle where we can turn the car around, and that will give us what we need. The only thing is that it's floated down the fjord from where it was first spotted. We're not too far off the ocean here, so we just need it not to, uh, not to hopefully move too much more in the next couple of days before we get the car on here and then we'll be we'll be in business. So how far has it moved from where you last saw it? About 20 kilometers. 20 kilometers? Could it be in the ocean in three days? It could. Yeah, here we'll already. There are signs of potential danger. Will be maximum because glaciologists call them reminders. Use it for land. The sound of an iceberg cracking. And that's what Jeremy and Nico are about to hear. Yeah. Is there anyone at Samiliga uh, that can... Remind you. What is it? Yeah, is there anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you love the sound of icebergs breaking in the morning? All icebergs, even the biggest one, breaks. So that's the rule. <laughs> so. That's the only thing we are always playing with. Jeremy reassures the team they found their racetrack. That's a big iceberg, very big. But it's, uh, it's, it's good, it's, it's, the best, it's the best one we've been on for sure. Now, they need to get to Kulasuk. This project relies on helicopters to do the heavy lifting. Powerful machines, but there are limits to what they can do. When carrying a significant load, a bit of wind is needed to help them get airborne. But the air is still. It's on its way, mate. Why is he still hovering? How did you weigh the box? How was the box weighed? So how, I don't know. Uh, Carlos, you know who weighed that box? Because 600 kilos, it, it scares me a little bit. If, if that gives us problem. Yeah. The attempt to lift the equipment case ends in failure, as the pilot is forced to release the load. So if this is too heavy, then what's going to happen with the car? Uh, this was just a test, and it's. Uh, and we have all this stuff out of the cabin. All right. OK. So we sort of, are you concerned about the car? We have, uh, as you could hear from Jan, yeah. we all, we've been concerned about the car all the time. <laughs> well, <laughs> Jan sent me an email saying he was happy with the weight, so... Uh, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you see Jan around now? No. <laughs> no, no, it's... Uh, it's uh, the number. The numbers is okay, but yeah. re real life and, and the numbers usually sometimes too. Right. Okay. Next, the car itself. Is it too heavy? Strapped to a reinforced steel platform, it weighs about one metric ton. At the absolute limit for a helicopter of this size. This project won't get much further unless the car can be successfully delivered 25 kilometers to the aircraft hangar in Kulasuk. 
This is Air Greenland's only Bell 212 helicopter within 650 kilometers. Finding a bigger one is not an option. It's now or never. Now the crew have time to prepare the car. A Formula E racing car costs approximately 250,000 pounds to build, not to mention many more millions in research and development. Frenchman Thio Guzin led the production team that designed the Formula E racing car. It's fully electric powered, 360 kilogram battery, lithium ion battery which deliver in qualifying 200 kilowatt, which is approximately 280 horsepower. It's not a complicated car, but there is a few, few things that you must make sure are okay before you run it. We charged the battery, checked all temperature, all cell voltage in the battery to, to make sure everything was all right, and now the car is ready to go. Formula is basically a playing ground, playing field for the constructor who want to improve that technology and show, demonstrate to people that they electric road car have a, have a good, uh, good future. Promoting electric car technology is what Formula E is all about. Worldwide sales of electric cars rose 77% in 2015. The trend is up. But the market for electric still represents only a tiny proportion of the overall motor industry. Political will is required to help raise awareness. And that's where Formula E plays its part. Take the city of Paris. The fact that it was a city centre race was the reason that the mayor of Paris gave her permission to let it happen. Anne Hidalgo is the mayor of Paris and her political regime is very keen on making Paris a green city, an e-city and a connected city. She wanted Formula E racing around her city centre to show Parisians the electric cars of the future. Lucas de Grassi takes the chequered flag and wins the first ever Visa Paris e Prix. There's no pollution. There's no noise. There is nothing to worry about except the additional people going on foot or by public transport 
to watch cars going around without creating fossil fuels. C'est vraiment un cadeau pour Paris et pour toutes celles et ceux qui croient dans cette formule d'avenir qu'est la mobilité électrique. Summer 2016 in Greenland is proving unusually warm. There's international concern about what's happening to the climate in the Arctic. It's the overwhelming judgment of science that the Earth is warming and human activity is the cause. Sixty kilometers north of Kulasuk is the giant Helheim Glacier. One of the biggest glaciers in Greenland. Six kilometers across. The glacier is constantly on the move, about 30 meters every 24 hours. Today, all is quiet. There is little carving activity, where icebergs break off the front wall of the glacier. But when a team of scientists from Swansea University came to visit, this is what they recorded on their time-lapse camera. One of the largest carving events ever captured on film. A chunk of ice about twice the size of Monte Carlo, breaking off the glacier. The amount of melting each year has gone up, so we're getting much more ice emitted into the ocean, which means Greenland's contributing more than all the mountain glaciers in the world to global sea level rise. Another big problem with melting of Greenland ice is that it will expose more land, and it's the whiteness of this ice that reflects sunlight out into space. It's this albedo, reflectivity. And the more ice we lose, the more warming we'll get. It's kind of, it's a runaway feedback mechanism. There's a whole string of, of feedback effects which make global warming and its effects worse if we don't restrain our carbon emissions or do something about the carbon in the atmosphere. We rely on that ice in Greenland. The North Pole is like the refrigeration unit for the planet. As soon as we lose that ice, the climate as a whole will change enormously. Helicopter mechanic Finn Lennart has been a regular visitor to the Helheim Glacier over the last 20 years. The glacier is receding all the places in Greenland. It was here, around here, and then it receded around what we can see now. I don't know what's it's happened, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it's a uh, it's a strange year. You know? It has been uh, very warm this summer, uh, warmer than normal. Of course, I'm worried because uh, 20 years ago we could see the edge, but today it's it uh, receded around uh, 20 kilometer in the fjord. Maybe it's uh, what you call the sequence coming and going again. It's a nice view, but uh, it's changed. <laughs> the scale of the change taking place in Greenland is almost beyond human comprehension. Try to imagine one cubic kilometer of ice. Multiply that by 230. That's the amount of freshwater glacial ice that Greenland is losing. 
every year. The population of Greenland is 55,000. The changes taking place in their environment threaten their way of life. It's a long summer and very short winter. Sometimes we have a lot of snow. This year, almost nothing. Born in Tasilak, Julius Nielsen is a local hunter and fisherman. He likes to take his dog sled across the pack ice in winter. When I was a teenager, you know you will use your dogs in November, and uh, at least December you can be safe and does sledding around. But uh, it's not possible anymore. My grandfather said that at least the last hundred years, it's melting, melting. The cases are smaller and smaller. But the last 20 years, it's incredible fast. At least 10 years, it's more and more fast. So it's not easy to say, is that a nature or human? Two days to go before the drive on the iceberg, reports reached the team of dramatic changes in the fjord. Nico, Jeremy and Carlos fly out to get a proper view of what's happened to their chosen iceberg. What they find is shocking. Nico, is that the, um, is that the iceberg in front of us in two pieces? It's been broken in three. Oh, It's two in front of us, and then the third piece is uh, a bit to the right, the biggest on the right. Excellent, there we go. Clear. The day before, Jeremy, Nico and a team of workers had been preparing the track on that iceberg. You are very lucky. Oh, well. I'm aware of time, so unless we need to do anything else here, can we go and look yeah. at the other one, please? Given that one is a that one is a, a dead duck. They check out a third iceberg. A potential backup. But now Nico is not so keen on what he's seeing. Totally amazing. I have to say Jeremy this, I don't like it uh, so much. Three main fractured lines right okay. here. Jeremy, we really need to look at it so that he can give us an opinion on it, no? Yeah, yeah, but I don't like it. Okay, that's out then. What about the one on the left? Is that worth looking at? I think it's not flat. Looks like it's uh, the one, the kinds, very smooth, the one that was in water first. Is that bad? Yeah. Has been flipping. This is absolute no-go, no. a mess. This is a very dangerous one. OK, let's go back to Kulasuk, please. Need to make some decisions. We just faced nature today. I didn't feel comfortable anymore to deal with that. The crack was maybe 15 metres away from the working area. I just don't want to be there uh, when this happens. I don't know if, uh, if before I underestimated just the feeling of it. I knew the dangers. I, I was okay with live with that, but uh, but I just changed that. Now I saw it. I don't want to do it anymore. The iceberg dream is dead. There is no chance of getting a crew onto an iceberg now. Look at the 
perception. There's disappointment and anger among the team. A lot of time, a lot of effort has gone into this project. Now it lies in pieces. Things have to happen to a timing schedule. This, Otherwise, this, place, doesn't offer, this place doesn't operate like that. It's it's just because can, can you just... On the landing strip in Kulasuk, there's a frank exchange of views. Here. I spoke broke yesterday. Yeah, there is a, aware of that. There is another one. I was aware of that offhand, but yes, I'm now aware of that. You so, know, can we silent can... about it? Let's talk. Yeah, so we can, yeah, you know, why we, will we clear it? deal with nature. So we have yeah, a plan. I understand. I understand. We need we to deal can with nature. I don't have a problem adapt with that. To that. Yeah, oh, Alejandro well, cancelled it this morning. So we, we're now coming back from that to go, what can we deliver? We have two hours whilst oh, he's flying yeah, yeah, to see what we can do. Well, you know what? My track record is that I've put, uh, done a lot of world first. I'm gutted that w at the moment we're not able to make the car yeah. run on that. The only reason this project... The issue is that um, the, the guys that were working on the iceberg yesterday, um, some of them are, are not not happy to, to go back and work on, on another iceberg because they think it's a challenge uh, you know, and, there's a, and, and there's a risk. So that's their, own, uh, that's their own decision. But we've come all this far, the car's here, you know, we've got the infrastructure. Uh, to walk away now would be, you know, would, would be a, a real shame. You know, we've got two hours to salvage this. I'm happy to help you. All right. You know, so I, you, I, 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 I'll I probably go I... there and say, no, this is not good no, enough, I, I, but I think, at least I'll we... go. Alejandro will arrive shortly, expecting to see his car in action. So a practical alternative is required. It might be possible to drive the car on the Greenland ice cap itself. Ice, but on solid ground. Nico and Tim, pilot and uh, glaciologist, they both think it's, uh, it's feasible, but we want to go up there and see for ourselves and whether the car can actually run you know, on the second biggest ice cap in the world. It's flat enough. We don't need to do anything to this. We don't have to go down the gradient, we can just go across. With the snow tyre, you'd do a donut, no problem on this. I don't know how much ice you could have. What do you reckon? Hey, if Carlos is happy, I'm happy. Give him as, as, as much distance as possible from the edge, if possible. This would represent a significant change of direction for the team, with fresh logistical challenges. From Kulusuk, the most accessible spot to reach the ice cap is here, the tiny village of Isotok, where the ice cap reaches the shoreline. Even by Greenland standards, Isotok is a remote spot, a hunting fishing community of barely a hundred people. From here, Carlos and Jeremy are able to report back to Alejandro that the ice drive is still on. You, you come on the helicopter and look at the glacier and look at the village that we're looking at now and the icebergs and everything, and I guarantee you, you have a 100% better product than we had originally. This is the very edge of the ice cap. The gigantic mass of sheet ice, three kilometers thick in places, that covers most of Greenland. Bosses in town. Alejandro and Lucas, who will drive the car, arrive in Kulusuk. There's been a change of plan, and they're going with it. For me, the most important is really to drive the car on the ice cap. Ice and cap's still okay. Yeah, ice cap is fine. So we take the car to the ice cap, we do the racing there, we do, we filmed, and what I really want to show is the effect of global warming on the ice cap and the acceleration of melting. Alejandro wants to see for himself what's happening in Greenland. He and Lucas take a boat trip to see the mini glacier in the fjord. This one has cracks all over. Yeah. Man, 
I was gonna be completely nuts to drive a car on top of this. Look shit. at the surface. I mean, yeah. it's it's too bumpy. Uh, this is just unbelievable. It's the first time in my life I see icebergs so close, and actually I'm seeing them melting. I can see the water falling. We can see the water falling from those uh, from the side of those icebergs, and seeing them like this just reinforces what we're doing. I think it makes us believe even more than promoting sustainability, and in our case, promoting electric cars is the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, we, we've been trying to find an iceberg and a stable iceberg to put the car on top of it. They keep breaking, they keep melting. Yulimon, we go talk shit. Now, stop. Now, no ice. What happens in 20 years? 20 yeah. years more? Yeah. So yes. Maybe. No. Yeah, no more. It's shoot day. Alejandro, Lucas, and the team arrive on the ice cap near Isotok. Preliminary shooting can begin before the car arrives. The mechanics are ready. The location is stunning. Now they just need the car to make the 60 kilometer journey across the coastline to Isotok. The first attempt to lift the car is unsuccessful. Not for the first time, they're struggling with heavy loads and a lack of wind. It's a problem of fuel, no? It's a problem of the... Well, it's a balance wind. between dis is distance and weight. That's distance the, and weight. Yeah. And the problem is if he tries and he doesn't make it here, I mean, he just have to drop the car somewhere in the middle of yeah, middle nowhere. Of yeah, exactly. More bad news. The car was damaged on takeoff. The rear wing caught on a rope and snapped in two. To go high, to go above yes. the yes, to, get, to get started. Uh, no, you bought your take off. And, 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 and I didn't, I didn't want to play. Now, what a great thing for us to do our rear wing. With some adjustments, they try again. A second failure. This is now mission critical. No car, no drive, no shoot. Carlos. On the ice cap, there is now genuine fear. This is not going to happen. No, no, don't, don't give me a call. Just do it. If you need to do it. Yeah, if you have to do it, but uh, yeah, try to get the helicopter, the, the car as soon as possible out of there. Yeah, it's okay. With time running out, they have one more attempt. This is their final chance to get the car to the ice cap, preferably in one piece. The car on its way at last. The TV and marketing teams can swing into action. This is what they produced. Beautiful, stunning, completely surreal. I feel incredibly lucky and privileged to be here. And I think we all need to do what we can to make sure that future generations have similar opportunities. 
global warming is in everybody's issues and we can't look away and ignore things. So we need solutions okay. for, for the future. Okay, you're ready to be the ice. As a company that is committed to driving progress in both areas, we were delighted to have this opportunity to work with Formula E and to support this very cool initiative. The value we share with Formula E is sustainability, visionary thinking, and there's also pioneering spirit. And I think these projects here give a strong message worldwide. Just an amazing experience. I never thought on my wildest dreams that I could be able to drive a race car on the ice cap. see a car racing on the ice cap and when they see they remember the problem of climate change of global warming that will be a great result I believe in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that there is such a thing as being too late and when it comes to climate change, that hour is almost upon us. But if we act here, and if we act now, if we place our own short-term interests behind the air that our young people will breathe and the food that they will eat and the water that they will drink and the hopes and dreams that sustain their lives, then we won't be too late for them.